All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is February 23rd, 2024, and I'm a day later than usual for my videos. I apologize, but kind of not. Um, I understand sometimes people just need a little bit more time to be able to go through and grasp and absorb and take in what's being revealed in the videos i know that they're not light you know i we've heard it over the years you know why aren't your videos shorter well because then most people wouldn't really learn much of anything you know if you decide to break up a video and make it 45 minutes 45 minutes 45 minutes and, and you do one two three four part one two three four by the time you get to the second the third the fourth almost nobody's watching them so it really didn't make any sense to split videos up and to make them in different ways, uh, in different portions and parts and so forth. And so I always recommend people watch them. As you watch them, take them in part. You can maybe absorb 45 minutes or an hour at a time, especially if you're newer, <coughs> excuse me, and, and diligently search them out. Seek them out, search them. See that what's being revealed is making sense to you. Pray over it. Ask the Spirit to lead you in it. Because I promise you, it is a mind-blowing experience to understand these revelations that have been revealed here. And what you're going to see in today's is, is something that, for those that have been around for a while, we've covered everything you're going to see today. Okay, It doesn't mean I don't want you to watch it, but I know that the vast majority don't understand at the same levels. And so... This is one, because there, since the last time we've done anything even similar to this, it's been quite a while, that, you know, we've talked about where it starts, we've talked about why we believe it's this year, but they've been kind of touched on and talked on in individual videos, but within each of those two, why this year and when this year, each of them have had things that have been brought to light over the past year and over the past several months and over the past few weeks. And so there's all of these additional pieces that get added to the picture and confirm and bring more and more and more clarity. And so that's why I thought today would be a great day, uh, a great time to do this video where it would be why we believe 2024 and when we believe in 2024 and to put it all together in one video. Am I going to be able to cover every single part and piece and point and detail? No, it would probably be a five-hour video. But we are going to go through all of these right here. And as we always do, it is Scripture. It is supported by Scripture. It is harvests of the Lord. It's his reference back to Scripture, where these things played out, what history has told us, what we can find throughout history, and in the time of Christ, and all of these things all combined together. So it is, it's, it's a journey. It's, it's a beautiful journey. It's exciting. And one of the reasons I want to do it as well is because a lot of people uh, are focused on April 8th and with this eclipse that's coming. I'm not saying the eclipse isn't connected to anything. But what I am saying is a lot of people tend to hang their hopes on a sign that that's when something's going to start. And so am I saying that for everybody here in this ministry? No. Might there be a few? Sure. Of course I know there are a few because over the years, when, when we were still tuning and, and drawing in closer and getting more and more revealed, we were looking at different events all along the way. And that really wore on people. It wore on me, and I know it wore on many others. And I know it even causes some to just say, oh, I'm taking a break and I'm leaving for a bit. You see, so I want people to understand and to know what we've revealed, why we've revealed it based on Scripture, so that if this time comes and goes, well, guess what? If it comes and April 8th is the date, hallelujah. We are ready. We are watching. We are praying. We are diligent. We are seeking the Lord. We're repentant. We are ready in Christ, spirit-filled. Doesn't make a difference. But if it doesn't, hopefully a video like this will strengthen your resolve and your understanding and that if this time comes and goes, you can always go back to this video. You can always come back to it and say, all right, let me revisit what it was he was saying again. Because in this video, I'm going to lay it out. But guess what? 
between now and the time that it comes, I'll bet you we will still have more revelation that will build to it because that's what's been happening here for six and a half years. So that's the plan for today's video. And also, the other reason, uh, that was one reason. I, I just, you know, I understand people meet, need more time. But the other piece of it, too, is I could have done it yesterday during the day because um, I knew my evening was going to be busy because yesterday was my son's 21st birthday. Man, my little buddy Ocean is now 21 years old. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that's a pretty wild trip, just flashing back and showing pictures. So we had our big family dinner. You know, we usually get together on Sundays and uh, have our family dinner. Well, it was his birthday, of course. So we all uh, had a big family dinner and cake and everything else. So uh, a shout out to my son who turned 21 on February 22nd. And you guys, for those of you who have been around for a while, uh, you know my story. It, uh, my, a little bit of my story, a little piece anyways, is how 222 had come up in my life since I was about, I noticed it from about 12, 13 years old. And it would just sporadically, and it's not something I would be conscious of or anything like that. And it wasn't until I was in my late 20s that I, I, I realized as I started pondering back on things how 20, uh, 222 started, had been popping up all throughout my life. And it started with my mom's envelope for her, her, her donations that she would give uh, to church. That's where it started when I was a little kid. And uh, here my son was, my firstborn. I've got a son and a daughter. My son's the firstborn. He's 21, and his birthday was 2-2-2. Two, two, two. How about that, right? So quite interesting. So that's where we're going to go today. That's uh, some reasons why I didn't do it yesterday and why I'm choosing to do this video now as well. Because it's also exciting. <laughs> it's really awesome to, to rehash, to, 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 to bring it in what, what we've known and bring it in to the newer things and to tie everything together and then and then try to ask yourself try to ask yourself i I've, I've done this so many times over the years and i don't do it as much as i used to and it's kind of a good thing because you really go down a rabbit hole of just pondering you know lord what about this and lord what about that and lord will you show me this and lord what about this and so i i've avoided doing that uh a lot less than i used to but in something like this, when you see something like today's video and, and you go through it and you're diligent and you're taking your time and you're seeking and searching it out, you have to, at the end, ask yourself, my goodness, I, look at it all. Look at all of the evidence that we can draw from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And it all points to the same time. It so much points to the same time that even the characters that we're hoping to be like were at the same time. It's pretty wild. All right. So with that, sip of coffee. With that, I'm going to do as I always do. Uh, for anybody that's new or newer, anybody checking these things out, anybody that wants to put a negative comment saying we don't know what we're talking about, and if you would only do this or only do that, this is the same thing that I post to every single one of you. Come to this playlist right here, right here, and watch the first four videos. If people want to complain and want to kick and scream and say you're making things up and you don't know what you're talking about, I will not respond to you until you have watched these first four videos there's i think well there's 12 videos in it watch the first four and follow them seek them out and you will see what it is that we're talking about and what's been revealed then i would be more than happy to have a conversation with you all right that's for the negative people for others just watch it just watch them and you will learn and you will understand what is being revealed here the other place you can go is ministryrevealed.com. This is the website. Go to the menu right here. Click the intro. And you have the same first four videos in order. This is a 22-minute intro to the next four videos. It gives you a little insight as to prepare you for the next three. This one, who the Gospels are speaking to, 
is a 30 minute Bible study to help you begin to understand why the the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke have a difference within the same stories and sometimes completely different about the same story. People have called these things contradictions. People have just shrugged them off. I mean, we believe in the word. So even though we couldn't understand it, we believe it anyway. Something is going on that we haven't yet understood. Well, this is your revealing of it. This is just the beginning. This is a 30-minute Bible study. You can easily follow along, and you can download the study notes to it if you want as well. From here, you're going to see that what this reveals is that the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days of the Synoptic Gospels is Luke, Mark, and Matthew. The, last will be fir the first will be last. The last will be first. In the end of days, it goes Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And when you understand that they're speaking to different groups, you realize that Luke is to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark is to the mid-trib great multitude rapture, the, the sleeping church, the not ready church, the world, the house of Israel, and the Gentiles are grafted in. This is the, the, the Mark group is the great multitude mid-trib rapture in the seventh year of seals. And Matthew is the seven years of trumpets, which is to the house of Judah. Where will Judah be during the first seven years of seals? They will be destroyed at the beginning and they will be having fled. They will come back a few of them to rebuild some stuff like the foundation. But I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> and But they're going to be removed from the land. The land is going to be destroyed. Like Jeremiah chapter 4 and other places say, the Lord's going to remove them. The land is going to rest for seven years. And then when the great multitude rapture happens, they will start to come back. The rebuilding will begin. And the whole story of the seven years of trumpets begins at that point then and and so that's why you have what you'll realize is that luke's discourse is different very different than matthew and luke uh, mark for a reason luke's is a short period of time after the pre-trib happens which is called above it's a period of 50 to 40 days in luke's discourse mark's is the seven years of seals matthew's is the seven years of trumpets that's why there are differences and we break it down this one is just a 30-minute intro to help you begin to understand it. The fourth video is the big one. It's about 2 hours and 45 minutes, and it will blow your mind. But not until you've started with these to understand what these differences are. And you'll realize that all these things have been missed or, or weren't yet ready in the Lord's timing to be made known until the final generation which we are in because everybody for centuries had been taught from the gospel of matthew so when everybody's foundation is matthew not having understood who mark and luke speak to they jumble it all into one this will help you to understand why that happened how that happened and the revelation of what seeing them all as their own works in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in their own writings, what they actually reveal. This is why everybody believes it's seven years. This is why everybody argues over pre, mid, or post when Scripture reveals them all. The answer is because they're all true. Luke is pre, Mark is mid, and Matthew is the post-trib return of the Lord. Then you can go deeper if you want. This is about a three-hour study on the differences in the Gospels. This is the discourses revealed, Luke, Mark, and Matthew, in order. It will blow your mind to understand these differences and what they reveal in them. But you must start with these first four videos. All right? So now that we got that done, let's get started in this. So... As the title somewhat, I'm not sure what exactly it will be yet, but as I had stated earlier, the conversation tonight, the, the, the teaching tonight is all about why we believe this year and why we believe when this year, okay? So we're going to go into that and we're going to start this with a, a quote from Isaac Newton that our sister shared in the forum Um Yesterday, I think it was, and I haven't shared this in quite a few years. And this was from Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton was a big-time Christian, and he was a major prophecy uh, seeker. 
And so I, I used to share this uh, a fair bit, and I just loved it. He says, about the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. Well, brothers and sisters, welcome to the clamor and opposition. <laughs> That's we, we get a whole lot of that here, don't we? You know, it would be nice to join with other uh, ministries and have conversations and discussions but there aren't too many that that are interested in having us so we're we're uh we'll see what happens with one brother here recently that lives near where i live actually and we'll see how things go and hopefully we can get more i'm going to reach out to another one tomorrow and uh let's see what we can do to reach out to more of these brothers and sisters and other watchmen and uh see what we can get how we can get this conversation uh really moving all right so why we believe 2024 and why when we believe 2024 and many of you guys might remember this i did a video a while back um yeah it's right here i did it and actually not too far ago right here the mystery of luke knowing all things in order it, it's so it's one of those revelations that really kind of has you just shaking your head when you realize the wording when you realize these mysteries hidden within the wording and i was talking to somebody actually i was talking to our sister tammy today who's got this chart that she's been working on and i'm kind of going through it she's built the whole thing and i'm just kind of going in and touching some things up for her. and we're going to present it to you guys here in the near future hopefully within the next couple of weeks i mean if you can't grasp everything, this chart will really help you understand many of these things. But I was talking to her and to another uh, a brother that, you know, when it comes to this revelation, I know, as you guys have seen over the years, that it, it's absolutely spirit led. It, it's not me. I always say I'm just like, I'm just the voice, you know, um, it, the, and the way it's always worked since September 8, 2017 is I just... The, in most cases, I read, and I just suddenly I understand. I, I know where it fits and where it goes with other places. In other cases, like we did with John 4, and we'll touch on that towards the end, in John 4, it, it's one of those things where I really wasn't pondering it. And then all of a sudden, bang, it's dropped into my spirit, and I instantly knew what the answer was. And the other way is sometimes it's just not the timing, I might have spent the last few years going back and forth trying to understand a piece of scripture and I still don't have it because it's either not the time or it's not yet made to be known and so I still don't know it. So I'm not saying I know all things. I don't. But the things that we have revealed, we absolutely understand. And Luke in order is one of those teachings. It is it's a wild teaching when you can understand this mystery of Luke knowing all things in order and what that means and without going into the detail because I just did the video a few months ago about it is chapter one, two, three, four of Luke is is this mystery, this prophetic mystery weaved into the words of the things that took place already in the is. Of course, right? It's Luke chapter one, two, three, four. So within it there are these incredible mysteries that reveal what we've already understood in the revelation of the end of days we know the pre-trib is going then there's an eight days the lord is coming on the eighth day and in john i mean in luke chapter one you have the birth of john then you have to the eighth day of circumcision that's then you go to luke chapter two and in luke chapter two it's the it, it's the picture of the 40 days of the son of man and it's connected to his birth and then when the 40 days are over we know it goes to the time of the holy ghost and then uh we're gonna have the six years uh, the seven years of seals and it's after six in the seventh year at the start of it the lord returns and on heavenly mount zion not feet down on the mount of olives and we get this prophetic picture when we get to luke chapter three and we see jesus there and he'd been baptized and john is now being taken into prison and they're all coming to the Lord and asking him. 
and we've seen that prophetic picture of, of, of built within it of it being a, a, an image weaved within as being when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals for that seventh year of seals. Then you go to Luke chapter four. And in Luke chapter four, we have the picture of Jesus being in the wilderness for 40 days with Satan and Satan saying all of these things were given to him in a moment of time. He's taken to the top of the temple and he's done all these things. And then Jesus uh, um, rejects and Satan is quote unquote defeated. And now he's gone from him for a season in time. It's a picture of the Lord then returning feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of the sixth year of trumpets or 13 years of tribulation, having defeated Satan. Satan gets bound and now everything is the Lord's. And when that 14th year comes to an end, Jesus declares the Jubilee. It is absolutely fantastic to see how it's all weaved in. And so it started with this Luke in Luke chapter one, verse three, saying it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto thee in order. I mean, you read this and you just think, wow, that's a pretty bold statement, right? That's a very, very bold statement that he had perfect understanding of all things from the beginning in order. Well, the mystery of that in the end of days is the pre-trib to the eighth day in Luke chapter 1. It's the 40 days of the Son of Man in Luke chapter 2. It's the return at the end of the sixth year of seals in chapter 3 and then his re on heavenly Mount Zion. And then his return feet down on the Mount of Olives in Luke chapter 4. It's all about his portions of time, his comings. Pre-trib, 40 days of the Son of Man, then end of seals, end of trumpets. It's fantastic. So let's go to the next one. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. And remember, it's the, the conversation here is we're going to dig into the year. Okay. Why 2024, which we'll touch on a little bit of the season, but that'll be more so uh, as we go forward. It's all about the year. So one of the big things is trying to understand, well, when was Jesus born, right? So we know Jesus' birth, and we know that there's a 40 days to his birth, right? When a woman uh, um, has a male child, it's the eighth day circumcision. It goes to from the beginning of the eighth day from his birth, circumcision, and then goes to the, the end of 40 days. So we've understood there's this 40-day connection. And, of course, many people for centuries and still now try to debate and argue when Jesus was born. We know when Jesus was born. It's been revealed through throughout history with people in the sun, moon, and stars. Okay? This is a great video. This is part one, and I've shared another one in the past. But this one, this guy's a lawyer, or was a lawyer, and he started studying in something, I can't remember what it was, that caught his attention, and he started to really look into the Star of Bethlehem. And when he did, he was blown away and he started getting more and more revelation, more understanding about it. And he's been touring the world for years, touring churches to show them when the birth of Christ was. And guess what it was? 15th day of the third month. Okay, Jesus was born in the third month and the 15th day at that time frame of what it calls the feast of weeks it's really the end of the feast of weeks but we would say the feast of weeks is that time frame when jesus was born and we've shown this even from a you know i've talked about it before there was an atheist and uh in a planetarium and he would always show these things and he worked there as as one of the the people doing the teachings and it was requested to do the star of bethlehem he did it he correlated to scripture he went to, to use the system and find out where all these things were. And it blew his mind because he was able to correlate it to scripture. And he says, just a, I don't remember, it wasn't instantly, but within uh, a short time of doing these teachings on it, he ended up becoming a Christian because he saw what was described in the Bible that he didn't believe, but he was using it as reference. And he saw that it was there. And guess what it was? You guessed it. Same time as this, that time of the Feast of Weeks, that time frame of the Feast of Weeks. 15th day of the third month. 
Well, we see this in many places, you know, when it comes to um, Isaac. We know Isaac is a type of Christ. And Isaac was born third month, middle of the month. On the festival of the first harvest, Isaac was born, and Abraham circumcised his son on the eighth day. This is, of course, from the Apocrypha from the Book of Jubilees. You see that Judah, who Christ also is a picture of the tribe of Judah, and he was also born on the third month, 15th day. It's very, very interesting that we have these extra biblical books, the Apocryphas, that help us along to show these things. Now, one of the things that we've recently also been teaching on is the year that Jesus was, bar what Jesus was born. And prior to uh, the middle of last year or, or around springtime of last year, I had believed it was possible that Jesus was born in 1 BC, not 2 BC, because in reality, there is a year zero. So this is why last year we were very excited as well for this season and time that we were looking at. But there were two things that were off. One of them related to Jeremiah 25, which reveals something for us scripturally in the end of days. And the other thing was we're operating globally around the world. We're operating in a Gregorian calendar. So if you're going back to look at dates and to understand these counts and to do all these things throughout history and, and, and when this king was born and, and have the year of this king from this year to that year, all of those dates, all of them, have been converted into Gregorian years. So when I had added a year zero, because in the sun, moon, and stars, there is a year zero, it threw everything off to believe it was last year. You'll see how that count comes about. When I realized by middle of last year, saying, hey, wait a second, here I am using the sun, moon, and stars, but a Gregorian count doesn't use a year zero. And we're trying to understand in a Gregorian year count. So when I remove the zero as their count does and realize that Christ was born in 2 BC at the time of the Feast of Weeks, well, then guess what? Look what we see as we progress to see what this all equals. Now, people will say, Jesus wasn't born in 2 BC. I've listened to Jonathan Kahn and I've listened to others. First of all, I'll tell you this. Nobody knows everything. And the things that people do know in their lane, in their areas, Jonathan Kahn has incredible understanding. I love Jonathan Kahn. He's a great messianic brother in Christ, right? But. He hasn't spent and been un and understood what we've understood. He hasn't had the revelation of the open books as we have. And I'm going to prove it to you because many churches like Jonathan Kahn, and I'm just using him as an example because I know this is something that he believes, is that he believes, so there's two, three, four, five. He believes Jesus was in 6 BC because of the claim of Herod dying in 4 BC. But when the church is taught on that, when seminaries teach on that, it's just it just becomes accepted. And this is a conversation we've had many times over the years. It's just like um, going to Matthew. You know, if you go to if seminary school and everything you've ever taught, because they're the teachers they're these other guys are the students and everybody's run through the seminary. And the foundation of everybody's teaching is from Matthew. And they go to Mark for maybe a little insight here. And they go to Luke a little bit less for a little insight there. They have no idea that they're missing Mark and that they're missing Luke and what they're actually telling us. So everybody comes out teaching from Matthew. Is it wrong to teach from Matthew? No. But you're missing a ton of the story. And we've proven that here. Because that's the revelation of what's come here. And so when, when people just accept 
what they've been told instead of seeking and searching it out. And they say, okay, Jesus was born in 6 BC. If you say Jesus was born in 6 BC because Herod was killed in 4 BC or died in 4 BC, then you have to believe that Jesus began his ministry in 24, 25 AD. And you have to believe that he was crucified in 28 AD. Hello. Do you remember, maybe some of you guys have heard of this. There's, um, there's a very large, like I'm saying millions of people. I think even the, the YouTube channel, I think it used to be called End 2028. And I think, if I remember correctly, there was like a million subscribers. I mean, there aren't very many Christian million plus subscribers of any channel. And so I remember seeing it and there were millions of followers of it around the world. Well, guess what? They were wrong. And do you know why? They believed 2028 was the return of the Lord. Which means if they were looking seven years earlier, I don't know what they teach now. I don't know how they get around it. With all of those followers, I don't, I don't know what they do. Because they've been teaching it for decades, years and years and years. That the end was 2028. You see? Why would they do that? Well, this connection, of course, to believing the time frame of Christ's birth. So it's no different than, say, a Jonathan Kahn, and you do the count, then Christ's death and resurrection was in uh, 28 AD. Well, then what about all the things that we have historically that point to and show us the crucifixion in 33 AD? There's a problem. You see? There's a big, big problem. And when you go to the Star of Bethlehem, when you go to that planetarium and you see what these people, non-believing and believing, but trying to seek it out, and non-believing trying to search it out and digging through the reference from Scripture and from historical books, guess what they found? It was 2 B.C. Not a single one of them say that it was 6 B.C. It wasn't possible. And this is very, you see, if we don't have a foundation of where to understand from, well, then nothing going forward will make any sense. Everything would be off. So let's see what that, what that ends up telling us. Okay, what about Herod? Okay, we have the story about Herod. And all the people believe that Herod died because that's what the schools teach in 4 BC. So if you're sitting in a pew at church and your pastors have gone to seminary school, they will tell you 4 BC. And there are very, very few. You know, another sister, uh, Ruth, had sent me a message today. We're, we're, we try to, to bring about these teachings and to share even little parts and little pieces based on maybe something in a Bible study or you're close to your pastor and you want to share these things with them. And she had shared, for example, the difference between Lucifer and Satan because the church believes Lucifer and Satan are the same being. We can show they're not. <clears throat> one was a cherubim, one was a seraphim. The beast is essentially Lucifer and dwelt. And then we know Satan comes down, who's the dragon. We see in Revelation 16 that the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet have spirits like frogs coming out of them. Uh, okay, we got the false prophet, that's covered. So how do you have Satan and the beast? One is Satan, one is Lucifer. We can show these things. One comes from around the throne of Christ. The other one comes around from around the throne of the Father. So these things that, you know, we're, we're just, we're not trying. I mean, sometimes, sometimes we're trying to give them the, the whole thing at once, right? But sometimes we're just trying to share a little bit. And when you try to share that little bit, you know what happens? Oh, what seminary school did he go to? Where, where was he taught? Where did you learn this? How did you learn that? They always want these degrees and these, these theological schools and seminaries and everything else. It's so difficult to break through to people who are already teaching in a convicted way that they already believe they've understood. Even though every one of them will say they don't know everything. And you just say, just follow this. Just follow me a little bit here. You know, it gets very difficult. And when you're leading churches, 
and you've got board members if you're in a church and there are board members and you can't make a change because it has to pass through the board and it's connected through through the bigger church and everything i mean it's impossible for a lot of these guys so we do these things spirit-led guiding us and leading us to to pray that the spirit will lead as many others to come and receive it to to open their eyes and their ears to circumcise their hearts that they would see it that they would receive it that they would help prepare many more for the time that's at hand and so this is the same thing with herod and you can come and read this for yourself it's hopeforisrael.org herod's death and it says placing herod's death around 1 bc allows us to accept the ancient tradition that the Messiah was born in 3 BC. The evidence of history, archaeology, astronomy, is now showing that Herod died in early 1 BC and that the Messiah was born in 3 to 2 BC, okay, in the regnal dating, as confirmed by Arrhenius, Clement of Alexandria, uh, Tertullian, all of these different people. And it goes on and explains it. It breaks it down the whole nine yards. I've been showing this for probably, man, five years now. Five years to show that Jesus was born in that 2 BC range. And I believe it is 2 BC. It's not a, a 3 BC, 2 BC. It was in 2 BC at the Feast of Weeks. Which means when you can understand this, when you could see and know connected to 2 BC, and you start to then track the events of scripture everything starts to open up okay watch this let's go to luke chapter 3 now luke chapter 3 in the prophetic is a picture of him returning at the end of seals you know it's time for the fruit and that the fruit is going to have to produce this is all about like john 15 forward it's that time of trumpets uh, um, John has done his job. John is, is a prophetic picture of a portion of a group of workers during seals who will put their necks on the line, who are going to help bring in the great multitude. So when division comes, which is during the tribulation time of seals, when it's father against son, mother against daughter, and so forth, it is this group of workers during seals, as we've taught on many times. They will be the John types, and what will they do? They will bring the fathers and sons, mothers and daughters and so forth back together in a picture as John did so that when Christ returns at the end of seals, they will be ready and it'll be the time of the great multitude rapture. We've broken it down many, many times. OK. Now, what's important here? Well, what about this? Jesus began to be about 30 years of age. Jesus began to be about 30 years, okay? What, what do we get for insight? Okay, Jesus began to be about 30 years of age. If you're trying to track it from, from you know, 6 BC or 3 or 4 or, or even understanding it in 2, what, how do you know, right? We can, we can look up some history. And people can be divided on it being 2 BC. Again, you have to remember it said 3, 2 BC because of just the way they were dividing the years, okay? But it was 2 BC based on the way we divide the years. It was in the 2 BC portion. So, but whether you're believing in 2 BC and you're on this side of the belief from when Herod died, or if you're in 6 BC because you're on the other side of when Herod died, once you've picked a side, the next thing you have to do is find more evidence going forward. So what do we do? Well, we have when Jesus began to be 30 years of age. We have it there in Luke chapter 3. So if we go into Luke chapter 3, we know that Jesus began to be 30 years of age. But guess what? We have a very important piece of scripture that starts it all off. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar in the 15th year of his reign. Now that starts to give us more of a picture because what we have is the 30th year of Jesus. Okay? So if you were saying 6 BC, you would say Jesus began to be 30 right here 
in that 24-25 year. Okay? But because I believe and I've understood by being able to prove 2 BC, and we know it's connected to the time frame of the Feast of Weeks on the 15th or the 15th day of the third month, we can show that Jesus began to be 30 in 28 BC. Uh, sorry, in 28 AD. But how can we prove that? For those of you that have been around for a while, you'll remember this. The Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin. Many people will say, oh, it's a fake. Oh, it's not true. Those people who have done that are the exact same people who will say stuff to me and message me and email me not having taken the time to seek and search it out for themselves. You don't want to believe it? Go ahead, don't believe it. But when you really look at the evidence of those who are involved in it, of those who, who have scanned it, of those who use this laser, laser technology and all of these new technologies, even since the old ones, when they first started doing it, it will absolutely blow your mind. And there's no way to get a print like this, except it was like like a release, almost like a, a nuclear blast of energy went from within and zapped it into the, the fabric. And all of the details are absolutely mind-boggling. And I, for one, as we've spoken on it before and taught on it, I have no doubt that it's real. The evidence in it is incredible. And for those of you who don't know, he was wearing this pendant. There was a pendant also found on it. And within the scans, they were able to see that the pendant had this. The 16th Hebrew letter that means 70 is ayin. Aleph, which is Taurus, means one, means the beginning. And noon is the 14th Hebrew letter, and the 14th Hebrew letter is the number 50. Pretty wild, right? Here we are in this ministry, and it's the revelation of the 14 years and the 50 days that come first. It's incredible. Well, what ended up being more incredible is I couldn't find what anybody understood that this meant. Well, we revealed what it meant. It's the head of Taurus. And we'll talk about that in a moment just to tie this all together. It's the head of Taurus. This, this is the right eye. So, so if we're looking up at the constellation of Taurus, this is the right eye, but it would be Taurus's left eye, right? From looking down. So this is the right eye looking up, and it's actually called Ayin. And Ayin means eye. Aleph, of course, because it's Taurus. It's the head of Taurus. It is Taurus. And the left eye of Taurus looking up is noon, and guess what? Noon means 14, and that eye of Taurus, which is called Aldebaran, which represents 14 and 50, is the 14th brightest star in the sky. Crazy stuff, right? If you're new and you haven't seen that before, <laughs> it's bananas incredible. It, it's really, really quite wild. But we'll kind of skim over a little bit of that again when we go into the, the the time that we're looking for so again we're we're talking about this in relation to luke chapter 13 uh, luke chapter 3 okay when jesus begins to be about 30 years old and it's in the 15th year of tiberius caesar this is a big deal because on the shroud of turn that when you know one of the biggest things for me that first got me to realize that the Shroud of Turin was real was the pendant. When I realized that what the pendant had written on it, and it was shared by um, Nelson Walters, or Waters or Walters, I, I, my jaw hit the floor. I was freaking out because it added to the revelation of what we were confirmed by the Holy Spirit. One actual knowingly, now it's all spirit-led, but one knowing Holy Spirit confirmation in all of my years of ministry where this thing happened, and it was all about a confirming confirmation of Taurus. And so when I saw what this pendant had on it, 
and knew that it meant the head of Taurus, it, it was, for me, I was sold because I couldn't find anywhere else where anybody knew that it meant Taurus. And so it blew me away. And then that caused me to look into more things about the Shroud of Turin as well. And all of these discoveries and everything they were able to pull out of it, it is over the top what they're able to find and the wording and, and the things etched. And I mean, it's it really is over the top. And if you really want to understand for yourself, seek out those videos. It'll blow your mind. So why was it important that in this chapter, it mentions it's the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar? And what does the Shroud of Turin have anything to do with it? Well, it turns out that there was a coin like the uh, like the widow's miter, mites, right? The, the miter of the widow, right? The two coins. There were two coins, one over each eye. And they were able to read what those coins said. Yep. Pretty crazy, right? And this is from the shroud.com, shroud.com. And again, they've been analyzing this for decades. And they found even more <clears throat> and confirmed things and got more detail of them. Well, this guy being spoken of here, it says, I was privileged to have first correctly, correctly dated that coin by identifying the Greek letters on the back, indicating that it was struck in the 16th year of the reign of Tiberius. Huh, what are we looking for? <clears throat> We're looking for the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. Because in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Jesus was 30 years old. So in 28 AD, Jesus began to be 30, and it was the 15th year of Tiberius. Well, this just told us that the 16th year of Tiberius is 29 AD. Ha. Now what do you do with that? This instantly, when, when you realize <clears throat> that the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar if the 16th is 29 AD, then the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar is 28 AD. When you realize that, and even uh, Nelson spoke about that on the video that he did a few years ago about this, not in relation to this, <clears throat> but in relation to the coins on the eyes and, and the parts of the, the discussion he did on the Shroud of Turin, it instantly throws out the window anybody who believed Jesus' death and resurrection was in 28 AD. Because the coins that were on his eyes were from 29 AD, which is the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. Hello. There's one piece of evidence. But we're looking for what? Not the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. We're looking for the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Jesus began to be what? 30. Did, did I make this up? No. All I did was research. The scriptures told us it was Jesus began to be 30. And the same scriptures told us it was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. This ancient shroud that was found in all of the technology digging into it found that the coins on Jesus' eyes were from the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar dated to 29 A.D., based on the archaeological evidence and the coins and things that they have from that time. Which means 28 AD was when Jesus began to be 30. So if we're co correlating scripture to historical documents and this shroud, and we can go all the way back to Jesus' birth, and when we do it, we can correlate it to people who have spent decades teaching and showing the time of Jesus' birth, then what do you say to those who try to tell you it was the sixth year of Tiberius Caesar? Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> that it was the, the 6th BC for Jesus' birth. You have to throw it out the window. It's wrong. It is wrong. He was born in 2 BC in a Gregorian calendar, no year zero. If you go to Stellarium, which does have a year zero, well, then it would show up as 1 BC. 
to the events in Scripture that are described, and you would see it right there. I think it's in June something, June 17th of 1 BC on Stellarium. And following the whole story from the year before, these people have done this. So we have the evidence in the sun, moon, and stars. We have the evidence of the sun, moon, and stars followed from Scripture by people who are professionals in it. We have biblical Scripture in Luke chapter 3 telling us that the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Jesus began to be 30. And we have historical evidence and documents and coins telling us that the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar was in the Gregorian year 29 AD. So now who are you going to believe? And now when everybody tells you, hey, Jesus in his death and resurrection, his crucifixion and resurrection was 33 AD, you could say, yep, sure was. Sure was. And people can show the evidence of that from historical documents and so forth as well. So isn't that interesting? <clears throat> I find that absolutely fascinating. We can show these points all the way through. And guess what? Do you know how, for those of you that are new, do you know how this chart grew and grew and grew to be so precise and on track? We know that the end of days is two sets of seven years for 14 years. So all I did was seven, 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 seven. We tracked it all the way back. We didn't have it all in the right order. You know, thinking first maybe 3 BC and then no year zero. Uh, uh, sorry, then a year zero. And, you know, and, and trying to track these things. But as we studied more, as we were more and more diligent, as we kept being persistent and tracking and, and seeing where Scripture was relating these things, this, this, it doesn't get any more clear. For me, it doesn't get any more clear. I didn't make it do this. This is what 2 BC in a year zero Gregorian count did. This is what a Gregorian count gave us. You see? Now, watch what happens. Now we go to Luke chapter 4. And we know in Luke chapter 4 that we're still in this time of that, that 28, 29 year that Jesus was in. But what is the prophetic picture? What is the timing? Well, check it out. This is his being tempted at the end of the 13 years. Satan is there. Jesus returns feet down. Satan's going to be defeated. Right? The Antichrist, the false prophet. Remember, the Antichrist and the false prophet, or the beast, I should say, and the false prophet are the first two cast into the lake of fire. Satan ends up getting beaten. He, he gets chained. And we know there's a big battle in that final year. So when we now get to what Jesus says here, in fact, if we go up a little bit further, in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, you can kind of see this this typology being the end of this final 14th year, okay? So it's like it's giving you a picture of the end of this 14th year. That's the picture that we're getting, okay? In the prophetic in the end of days. And listen what it says. Because now, remember, he just defeated Satan, okay? And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. You see, you have this, this picture of him having been victorious at the end when you understand Luke in order. Okay, so now you're at this prophetic picture at the end, towards the end of the 14th year. <clears throat> And look at what happens in Luke chapter eight. Uh, sorry, in Luke chapter four, verse 18, he then says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set them at liberty. 
that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and he closed the book think of it like that and he closed the book it's over he closed the book okay now this was something that we recently I mean I had seen it there over the years as many people have but it hadn't dawned on me until our brother Ivan shared it with me that Jesus was proclaiming Isaiah 61 and he was proclaiming the Jubilee year now being at hand and all you have to do is go look it up you can you can look it up everywhere see for Isaiah uh, Luke 4 14 through 30 Isaiah 61 Isaiah 61 Luke 4 Isaiah 61 it's everywhere so listen to what it, they, they put here when uh, God's Messiah comes he will usher in the year of God's favor and Jesus read it out and said in effect it's me I'm bringing the year of God's favor the eschatological what year of Jubilee he was proclaiming that the year of Jubilee was at hand okay we in here it is in Isaiah 61 the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he has sent me to bind up the broken harbored to proclaim liberty unto the captives and to open the prison of them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God you see you know why he didn't say this right because it was the time of vengeance was now at hand in the end of days at his time it wasn't the time of vengeance yet but prophetically to the time of the final Jubilee that is the final 14th year okay so now watch what happens we go to Leviticus and let's re read what Leviticus chapter 25 said in Leviticus chapter 25 we see um, you know of course about the law and this is all about the Jubilee and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee even seven times seven years and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee 49 years okay so when we go to our end of days chart there's from the other from the last Jubilee which began the the first year there's one two three four Sabbaths five six seven look at that seven Sabbaths ends right here which means this proclamation happening at the end and what happens it's the final Jubilee well, that's pretty wild isn't it but how did I get to this being a Jubilee did I just start making up these counts first of all scripture just said that a Jubilee comes after seven times seven years 49 years are complete and then it's a jubilee i didn't make it up this is this is the count but how did i get to this count <clears throat> excuse me well it brings us back to jesus's time let's go see going back into jesus's time and understand what's being said okay if we know that this is the 15th year of tiberius caesar which we do we know that jesus then by the end of this time right towards the end of this year that he was in he was what well in luke chapter 4 he was declaring that the jubilee was at hand jesus himself was declaring the jubilee you read anything on this and it's obvious because he's fulfilling isaiah chapter 61 to get to the final year to to have this happen and then to have the jubilee happen means it had to be the 49th year and he was declaring the year of 29 to be a jubilee why would it be 29 a.d because he was in 28 a.d when he began to be 30 and guess what happened 
it was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. So if we're in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, we're coming towards the end of, the, of a biblical godly count year to where Jesus would then be proclaiming the Jubilee was at hand. Which means towards the end of that 28th year, Jesus is declaring the Jubilee. Which means 29 AD was what? A Jubilee. Did I make this up? No, it's right there in Scripture. It's right there for everyone to read and see. You can understand his birth. You can understand the timing with the sun, moon, and stars. You can understand the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, him being him uh, uh, turning 30. You could see that in Luke chapter 4, he's declaring that the Jubilee is at hand, which means biblically speaking, in, in a biblical chronology of, of a godly count, he was declaring the Jubilee of 29 was beginning. Which means the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar in 29 AD was the Jubilee. It's not very difficult, right? It's right there for us to understand. So guess what happens? When you understand that the Jubilee is the first year of the next seven-year cycle, what did we do? We just started counting Shemitahs. Counting Shemitahs all the way through, dot, 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 all the way through, kept counting, counting, counting. Counted every seventh year, every seventh year. <clears throat> every seventh year and every Jubilee along the way. There was the last one, 89 to 90 which started the new cycle, right? So there's your Sabbath. And we followed this all the way through based on what Scripture said and what historians have shown, what theologians have studied, and it's right there in black and white in Scripture. Jesus was fulfilling the words of Isaiah 61. And we followed that through. And the Jubilee equals 2038 is the beginning of the Jubilee. Do you know that most people don't realize that at the end, even in a seven-year belief, so if somebody, which is the vast majority, of course, believe in a seven-year tribulation, when that seven-year tribulation is over, it has to be the Jubilee. Okay? It doesn't matter if you believe three and a half, like I, I don't know how people believe in that, but if somebody believes in three and a half or they believe in 10 or they believe in seven, regardless of what they believe, when that final year is over, it must be the Jubilee. Because the Jubilee is the new beginning. The, new, the Jubilee is the forgiveness of all debts, proclaiming liberty to the captives, and everything is over. It's when they will be brought back into their own land, and they will be given divisions back in when the tribulation is over to the tribes of Israel living back in the land. Their millennial reign will begin. It has to be a jubilee. Not kind of. Not maybe, not sort of. It, it 100% has to be i did not invent this i did not fit the count to make it land there we know there's seven and seven seven of seals seven of trumpets seven years of readying the bride and all we did was follow it all the way back that's all we did all the way all the way all the way and you guys, we've talked about this recently, and it just so happened, look at this, that the seven years of the King James Bible, the number one selling, number one read, best selling for decades, year after year, number one on the charts, they removed it from the bestseller charts because it's always number one, began in 1604 and ended in 1611. Do you think it's by chance it landed exactly? On a seven-year cycle? I don't think that's by chance. Do I think it's by chance that 
this ministry and, and having been revealed, the open books began in 2017 in September. And in 2024 is a seven-year cycle. Do I think it's it's by chance that the Revelation 12 sign that got the world's attention and tens of millions of people or more around the world and got them all watching, excited, started in 2017 and seven years is 2024? Think that's all by chance? You think that's all by chance? That the Jubilee lands there with 14 more years to go in the ministry that has the revelation of the open books and there's 14 more years and the 15th being the Jubilee, which is another way of saying the 49th and then the Jubilee. These The seven and seven are the last two sevens of the 49. One is to the church that wasn't ready and one is to Judah. None of this. Not, not, nothing's invented. Not a single thing. Every part and piece comes from Scripture, comes from events on the earth, comes from, comes from the sun, moon, and stars, comes from the sun, moon, and stars, comes from Scripture, comes from uh, um, more Scripture, comes from historical records and, and literal coins and documents and a, tur and a shroud of Turin. You see why I get excited, why so many of us here are excited for 2024? Everything is in its place according to the historical record and according to Scripture. And the Lord works on Shemitah cycles. It's fascinating. And the best Bible in history, the one that we use as well, the King James Bible, I know for a fact that I couldn't have revealed everything I've revealed throughout Scripture had I not been using the King James Bible. Because I've gone to look at other ones and it, it, in so many places because they change, they have to change the wordings within them so that there's not copyrights in these different Bibles. You can't actually get the proper picture because they'll translate certain portions to to give a meaning of their interpretation because something has to be changed in parts and pieces here and there throughout. Or it would be a copyright of the other Bible. And they want to make the income from it. You see? King James Bible is the Bible. And what is it? Uh, Truth in Christ, I think is his name. Brandon. He, he shows the evidence of it. Well, this is another one for Brandon. It lands exactly in a Shemitah year cycle. In a Sabbath year cycle, I mean. Well, Shemitah, Sabbath year cycle, same thing. So you understand, if you haven't seen this before, why we're so excited. But you know what? That's still not the end. Because guess what happens? If you go to Jeremiah chapter 25, in Jeremiah chapter 25, again, something we've covered a number of times over the last little bit, Watch what it says. In Jeremiah chapter 25, there has to be something relating to 70 years. In the end of days, being 14 years, we know there isn't a, a literal 70 years of captivity for Israel again. We know it, it, these things aren't playing out over decades and centuries and over the millennium again. We know that the was, which is from creation until Christ, the is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, and the is to come is from the pre-trib to the end. These things that played out in the was, that have played out in the is, in the end of days, will play out over 50 days and 14 years. So we're not looking for centuries of things and decades of things to be repeated in the exact same picture. That's not what's going to happen. It's going to be packed into 14 years, as Mark says for seals and as Matthew says for trumpets, into a period of time worse than it had ever been in human history up to that point. And then in Matthew's, it says this will be even worse than that one from Mark's and that it will never be that bad again. That's because what played out over thousands of years will play out over 50 days and 14 years. So when we're seeing this 70, we know it's not that something's going to play out over this whole 70-year stretch again. 
So what is this prophetic picture that we're trying to understand? Well, let's have a read. In Jeremiah chapter 25, it says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Well, we know that that's not going to play out exactly like that again, right? <clears throat> so there has to be a prophetic picture for us because we know it's also speaking about the end of days. See the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the millstone, right? And the light of a candle. This is all going back to the to Revelation. And what does it say? And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. So there's a 70 year period of time to be accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldees, and I will make it perpetual desolations. So how does this, <coughs> excuse me, relate to also showing 2024? Well, when Israel captured the rest of Jerusalem in 1967, they now had all of Jerusalem. That's why there's all this talk all the time, especially now with the war and everything that's going on. That war is going to continue until the time of the pre-trib and the first attack that's coming on Israel, which, as I've shown, I believe will be at the time of the 9th of Av in 2024. Based on what I'm showing here, you, you hear that the evidence has been clear that 2024 is highly probably, I can never say 100% because I don't have a thus say it the Lord. I just have understanding in scripture. Everything is showing us it will be 2024. And then you look at everything around the world and things going on in Israel. Uh, it seems so obvious now. It's so blatant. But watch this. Look at how it happened on a Shemitah cycle. Here they are. They captured Jerusalem in 1967. Guess what? You count out 70 years. And that ends in the 13th year of tribulation the 70th year comes to an end the 70th year ends at the end of the 13th year of tribulation so you've got six years of seals and the lord is seen coming on heavenly mount zion like at the end of the sixth seal he's here during the seventh he's here while the rebuilding of the city and streets and temple for the first three and a half years he gets cut off. There's a war with Satan and, and the beast and the false prophet against the two witnesses for two and a half years, which brings it to the end of the 13th year of tribulation or the end of the sixth year of seals. When this 13th year is over, guess what? It equals the end of 70 years since they captured Jerusalem. So what did Jeremiah say? When 70 years are accomplished, then I will punish the king of Babylon, right? Make it perpetual desolations. Jeremiah 25, 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury in at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink. <clears throat> because they shall drink, sorry, and they shall drink and be moved and be mad because the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup of the Lord's hand and made all nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me, to wit Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof, to make them a desolation and astonishment, a hissing and a curse as it is this day. Let's keep going down. Verse 26. It lays out all these different kings around the world. And all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth and the king of Shechem shall drink after them I goes on to say in verse 27 halfway through drink ye and be drunk and spew and fall and rise no more because the sword which I will send among you verse 29 for lo I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name remember Zechariah 14 starts with another attack coming on Jerusalem and should you be utterly unpunished? Yea, uh, sorry, ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 30. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high. Okay? 
the lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall, um, he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. When is he treading the grapes? Well, if we just saw a 70 ending and it said when the 70 years are accomplished, that means in this final year is when he's going to come and tread upon the grapes. Well, what do we know about that? You guessed it. We know what sort it is, right? It's the Lord coming. It's the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives to make war, crowns in his head. And it says in Revelation 19, 13, and he was clothed, clothed with a vestiger dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress, the sword, the nations, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. Hello. Remember what happens here? And then you see the beast and the kings of the earth. And then we see that the beast was taken and with them the false prophet. And they were the first two cast into the lake of fire. This happens according to Jeremiah when 70 years are accomplished, which means after, at the end of the 13th year, which means what? In the 14th year. Well, guess what? This is the 14th year of tribulation. It's the final year of tribulation at the treading of the grapes of the wrath of God. <laughs> you see, this is this is when he's going to bind Satan. Remember what Luke 4 said? Luke 4, he binds Satan, he defeats him. Everybody's going to cheer over him after he defeats the enemy. And then he's going to what? Make a decree, make a declaration of the Jubilee. It's all in order. It's all there. There hasn't been one hiccup in anything that I said that is scripturally written. And you can add the end of 70 years of Jerusalem to it. What happens in this 14th year? Well, look and see for yourself. We even see it in Zechariah chapter 14. And it just so happens Zechariah, for those that are new, has 14 chapters. And the only other book with 14 chapters is Hosea because one is speaking to the Gentile, right? Hosea to, to Osi, to, those, to her that isn't my bride, will be my bride, right? Will be my beloved. And then we have Zechariah, which is written to Judah. 14 chapters, 14 chapters, 14 years, 14 years. And so look what happens when you get to Zechariah 14, which is at the end of 13. There's the start of 14. And what is it? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. You see that? What did he say in Jeremiah 25? That he begins it at Jerusalem. And the city shall be taken. And the house rifled and the women ravished. And half the city shall go into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. You see, because he allowed it to come against Jerusalem first, like he said he would at the end of 70 in Jeremiah 25. And now he got them, as Jeremiah said, to drink the wine of the cup of the wrath of the Lord. And it says, uh, those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle, and when is it? Here he comes, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Everything is in its place. So where would Zechariah 14 be? The 14th year right here. When? According to Jeremiah, after 70 years are complete, and he brings, the, he brings them against Jerusalem first, 
and then he has them all drink the cup of the wrath of God and then he brings the sword upon them for the treading of the grapes and when it's over which is like Luke chapter 4 and Satan is defeated and bound he declares the Jubilee <laughs> it's all there <clears throat> it's it, it's like one of those things you know when when I'm putting the video together and, I, and I'm planning out where I'm gonna go I don't go into every single detail I mean I know overall every place I'm gonna go but I make little notes by by putting up tabs but when you when when you go into it you know like I haven't done in a little bit and you go into it piece by piece into every part everything everything that I have shown you everything from this chart from the count of Jesus's birth is in scripture is in the Sun moon and stars is in historical documents coins the shroud a, a, a physical year count from our generation being the final generation the whole thing To be honest with you, I don't see how it can't be 2024. I I really don't. I I, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> if it's not 2024 in some other year, I don't know. I really don't. We'll still be watching every year and digging and seeking and searching. But since this chart was put together and all of these parts in it, over the last year, I have never seen more crystal clear evidence for this truth of 2024 than I have in this. And it hasn't changed since we completed this, you know, almost a year ago, 10 months ago. It's incredible. So I hope you're seeing it, guys. <clears throat> I hope you're able to, to, to grasp, to understand 2024 is here we're in it right february 23rd 2024 so we're in the gregorian year of 2024 but now where is the lord pointing us to within 2024 in scripture okay and this I was going to bring this up. Oh, maybe I will. It always resets when I when I go through it. So let's give me a second here. There's our bull. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's all connected. <coughs> Excuse me. The whole thing is connected to Taurus. But I want you to see this because on, on March 10th will be the four-year anniversary, which I find interesting based on info we've been revealing from John. <clears throat> but for those who haven't been around for, for a long time, it began right here. This video was posted about 12 hours or so before COVID began. And it was about the, the revelation that had happened based on Numbers chapter 13 when Hosea has his name changed by Moses. So Hosea, who's from the tribe of Ephraim, has his, his name changed from Hosea to Yeshua or Joshua. And it's fantastic because what you see is that, let's go to it real quick. Numbers chapter 13. It's a picture of the end of seals when the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. So we have Osi, okay, Oshi, which means Hosea, who is the son of Nun, okay? And his name, and Nun means perpetuity. Look at that. The father of Joshua. So like the father of Yeshua, okay? It's perpetuity. It's uh, perpetual, continued. So <clears throat> this is when, actually, this is when Moses changed his name. Right here we see, uh, Numbers 13, 8, of the tribe of Ephraim, Osi, or Hosea, the son of Nun. So tribe of Ephraim. What do we know and what have we been teaching over the past several months or a year or so 
in relation to what we know about when Messiah comes at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals. When he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, he is coming as Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah Ephraim. That's who he's coming as. He's coming as the high priest and king. And this Osi was because, like Hosea, he came as the deliverer in the beginning. And his father is noon. What is noon? It's the 14th Hebrew letter, and it equals the number 50. What's the revelation from the Father through the Spirit? 50 days and 14 years. And then we see here with the spies that Moses changes his name from Osi or Hosea to the son of Nun, Yeshua, Joshua. Who, was jo who did Joshua end up becoming? High priest and king. From what? From the tribe of Ephraim. We know Messiah is coming at the end of the sixth year of seals on heavenly Mount Zion. The mountain carved without hand, defeat the enemies in the Ezekiel 39 war. And then he become, he's there as high priest and king. You see? And what's the connection? It was that it was connected that Jesus was connected to the father whose name is noon, which means 50 and 14. Well, what, do we, what did this come to reveal? That it was connected to Taurus. And for those of you that don't know, I'm not going to go into all of it, but I prayed on that on this night after doing this video. I, I, was, I, was, a little, I was a bit panicky because I even say this year, right? After the 50th, the tribulation begins this year. And that was back in 2020. Obviously, there was more understanding in the details of where the year count and the Jubilee and all that stuff was. But the revelation that was in it had me panicking. And I said, Lord, oh, if I misunderstood, Lord, please, please, if, if I don't get confirmation of this, of, of what I've said, I want you to confirm to me the number 50 that I've understood. So I need to see something that will catch my attention with the number 50 and let me know that I have understood, that, that I'm on track. And I wanted it by the following morning. My whole family was asleep. I was praying this prayer in my thoughts in the shower. And by 1 o'clock in the morning, I see an email flashing on my phone. I look at it, and the title is message or something along the lines of message for you from the Holy Spirit. And I freaked. <laughs> a lot of you guys know the story, but I mean, I, I, I flipped, man. I read it, and she said she paused the video at the 50-minute mark of the video. There was my 50. And she said, the Spirit told me to tell, the Holy Ghost told me to tell you, and she put it in parentheses to say that you are right on target. And I went, whoa! <laughs> it was it was the most it, it's something in my life that nobody will ever be able to take away from me they can never they could say whatever they want till they're blue in the face i don't care i know what happened and i've never had an experience like that ever it was fantastic and it was our sister jodell that had sent that to me and then i go on to explain it in this video uh, the next one that I had posted about it. I was freaking out. Was the year wrong? Yeah, of course, the year was wrong. But the revelation wasn't. And the revelation of the 50 before the 14 years begins was the revelation that it began in Taurus. And then all of these things started to open. Just like as I told you guys earlier. Then this... Stuff with the Shroud of Turin started to reveal over the next year or two. And just more and more and more. And I came to discover that the Jews, to the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in their zodiac. Consequently, uh, it was represented by the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, right? Which is Aleph. You guys all know that. The Hebrew alphabet. You get the Hebrew alphabet. Here it is right here. 1 to 3, 4, 5 goes 1 to 400. 1 through 9 
then 10, 20, 30, all the way to 90, then 100, 200, 300, 400. How many letters? 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Wasn't well, that fascinating in our revelation of the end of days? What is it? It's the seven easy years, like Jacob working for Leah. Then seven years that he has to fulfill for Rachel. Then he has six more years for the cattle, for a total of 20 years where he's working for his father-in-law. And then the final year, they make themselves a covenant. Ta-da. Fascinating how it works, right? Seven easy years. He doesn't get anything here. It's all working to get his first bride. And then he gets her. And then he gets the other one, but he's got to fulfill seven more years for her. And then six for the cattle. Then a covenant in the final year. It's, it's incredible because what's the picture? Seven, 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 and one for a total of 22. 22 what are the tribulation is it all 21 no the first seven is preparing the bride the second seven is seals the third seven is trumpets so let's keep going 22 22 letters and each letter has a, a pictograph meaning and each one has a number so when you look at it you see that aleph is the ox it's a it's the beginning it's the ox right so they put it right in the beginning and why did they put it at the beginning because they knew it was the beginning of their alphabet of course right they made it the beginning of their alphabet and why did they make it at the beginning of their alphabet well when you dig into these things you realize that the beginning in the beginning, God created. The word beginning is the word for Jesus. We've shared this a number of times as well. It's fascinating. This word beginning is Jesus. So in the beginning, the Father created. So in Christ, God the Father created. Okay? In Christ, Jesus God, the Father God created. Because he gave everything to Jesus to create. And the word beginning, as you guys all know, is the feast of first fruits. There's only one who is the feast of first fruits, and that's Christ. That's how you know he's the beginning. And of course he's the beginning, because what is he? He's the beginning and the end. He's what? He's the Aleph and the Tav. Okay? He's the Aleph, the beginning, the ox, and he's the Tav, the sign of the cross at the end. He's the beginning, and he's the end. So if the beginning is the Feast of First Fruits, which we know by the word, <clears throat> 7225, uh, and we go to Leviticus 23, and you go to the Feast of First Fruits, when you come to the Feast of First Fruits, see the Feast of First Fruits, there it is right there, 7225. Jesus is the first fruits of the sheaf of the wave offering. The one without leaven. <clears throat> it's Jesus. So if Jesus is the feast of first fruits and the beginning is called first fruits as in Jesus, and Jesus literally calls himself the beginning and the end, and what is the beginning? Taurus which means the beginning started in Taurus. And when you understand that it began in Taurus, and I'm not making it up, it's historical evidence. It's, it's, it's a fact throughout history. Go talk to the Jews. You've got their actual alphabet of 22 letters, and it's called Aleph because it starts with Taurus. The reason they did it was because the first constellation in ancient days was Taurus. See, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's just history and research and scripture and, and digging into these things. It's, it represents Taurus as a whole, but it represents the head of Taurus. Well, remember what I said. 
<clears throat> remember what I said about the pendant and what it said on the pendant from right to left, like the Jews read, ayin, which means 70, aleph, which means one, and Taurus, and noon, which is the 14th letter, and means the number 50. Well, do you know what it means with, as I said a moment ago, what does it mean with Taurus? This eye of Taurus is called ayin. Jesus was wearing the pendant of Taurus. It had ayin, Taurus, and noon on the left side. Noon is the 14th brightest star in the sky, and it represents 50. He was wearing a Taurus pendant. When we first revealed this uh, uh, f about three years ago or whatever it was, man, I mean, crazy, crazy wild stuff. So when you understand that this is Christ in the beginning, and it's the Father that gave it all to him to go and create, you understand that it was him. Which means in the beginning was what? <clears throat> Taurus. It all began in Taurus. And it began on what? Well, the word beginning, not only does it represent Taurus, but it represents Feast of First Fruits. So the Feast of First Fruits to the Father, when the beginning started, happened on that 15th, 16th day, <coughs> excuse me, the 16th day in Taurus. This is going to be important. Now, Let's go to what we read <clears throat> in Isaiah 46, starting in verse 9. Listen to this. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done <clears throat> see what he's saying I'll de I'm declaring the end and I'm declaring the end from the beginning <clears throat> sound familiar it should sound familiar to us right it's something we've shared on over the last couple years and recently from the gospel of Thomas another apocrypha book right and it's sayings that Jesus said and in verse 18 it says the disciples said to Jesus tell us how our end will be Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? So he's saying, if you can discover the beginning, then you can come to understand the end. For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Well, where was the beginning? Taurus. The beginning was Jesus. And in the beginning, it was Taurus, which is represented by Jesus. And it was the feast, the representation of the feast of first fruits, which is Jesus. So we know where the beginning is. Well, what does he say? There will the end be. Blessed is he who takes his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. Wow. Are you ready, guys? Are you ready? Is there a group of people who have found the beginning to understand the end? Because where the beginning is, there the end is? Because according to this, even though it's apocrypha, according to this, it lines up with what we've revealed from Scripture. And it says, blessed is he who takes his place in the beginning. He will know the end and will not experience death. Who gets to take his place in the beginning that won't experience death? Well, who's the same prophetic picture of being the beginning and not experiencing death? Of course, it's Enoch, right? We know that's Enoch as well. So that's why when, when uh, we'll talk about it in a sec, but we see... You see, 
when when uh the beginning happened like in the beginning it was all taurus right the beginning of the year started in taurus when when enoch was there the beginning was taurus when uh moses was there it was taurus when abraham was around it was taurus when god gave the law it was taurus when god gave the law when he told moses this is the beginning of your months and it shall be the first month of the year to you it was taurus so when god tells this to moses and god gave the law did it did he change his law would he tell moses and abraham and enoch and all of them if they were here now oh don't look at taurus we're in pisces now that makes no sense to me does there have to be an accommodation for it because of the cycles of the earth for which we're living on because the sun has gone forward by two months yeah i believe there has to be something for it but does god change you think he changed his law because the sun had the procession of the equinoxes if every one of those people i mentioned looked up to the sky as i've said recently looked up there they would all agree and say ah oh, there's taurus there's the beginning Every, everybody else all the jews would say no 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 it's it's pisces they would say oh you know, if you don't believe scripture okay you see it, it's really it's fascinating when you understand because it's the same thing with enoch and enoch was at a time where it was taurus and so if the beginning was taurus and we know enoch was taken at the feast of weeks according to historical records right according to the documents being passed down and everything else and he never tasted of death and that's the same the same context we're getting here the beginning shall find the end and whoever finds it will take their place in the beginning he will know the end and will not experience death we have the exact same kind of conversation going on here. And again, it's something we've shared a number of times in relation to Enoch. Because this story in Hebrews chapter 11 is the same story as Luke in order. By, fe by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Right? That he had faith, that he pleased God, and knew that he was a rewarder of them that diligently sought him. This is like Luke chapter 1, the pre-trib. Then you have the eight days, and you go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is the 40 days. This is a picture of the Lord here for 40 days in relation to the story of Noah. And then when the 40 days are over, like Luke chapter 3, we have the picture of Abraham coming into the land of, his, of promise, looking for a place where a foundation was laid, because the foundation of the temple was, is only going to be laid during seals, but nothing else will get finished. This is a picture of the end of seals and the Lord coming. And the time of the great multitude rapture and Judah after them and so forth. So you got Luke 1, you've got Luke 2, you've got Luke 3, and then what do you get? By faith, Sarah was delivered of a man-child, which was, of course, Isaac. And this is the post-trib return of the Lord. It's a picture of Luke 1, 2, 3, 4 in order. And who are we looking to be like? Like one who was there in the beginning, like one who didn't taste of death, one connected to the Feast of Weeks. All this stuff in order. Let's go back to Isaiah 46. So he says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Now listen to this. You see this? He's telling you about the end of days. 
He's telling you that he's declaring the end from the beginning. The end of what? The end of days is being declared from the beginning of the word. Like we reveal here. And now listen to what he says next. Calling a ravenous bird from the east. Calling a ravenous bird from the east. The man that executes my counsel from a far country. Yea, have I spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Sound familiar? A ravenous or raven bird? What do we know it's a picture of? After the 40 days of the Son of Man, like Luke chapter 2? Right? In relation, not the 40 days against Satan. This is the 40 days first in the picture of his birth. And the 40 days of the Son of Man being here. Like the days of Noah for the 40 days. And then what happens? The raven goes out. And the raven is, is the meaning for the word Arab. And what does the raven do? The raven's going to surround Jerusalem at the end of the at the end of the 40 days. And then the dove on the 50th day is going to anoint the chosen workers. And they go out from Jerusalem. And then the raven, who is the Arab, who is Ishmael, who is Syria, and those with them will attack and destroy Jerusalem at the start of the 14 years. What did he say? He's sending a ravenous bird that that man is going to execute his counsel because the Lord uses the enemy all the time, right? Listen to verse 12. Hearken unto me, you stout-hearted that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. Sorry, give me a second. My mouth's getting dry. There we go. I will bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion, for Israel is my glory. When is he coming on heavenly Mount Zion? End of seals? Hello. How does it start? The ravenous bird. But the ravenous bird doesn't come till after the beginning, which is those who take part in the beginning who will not taste of death. Hello. All of this connected to the beginning. The beginning is connected to Taurus. And in the beginning being Taurus, it's representing the 15th day or the 16th day of the first month. So right now, because of the thousands of years in the procession of the equinoxes, Nisan is called the first month here. But two months later, you're in Savan. So if you go from, and a lot of people will say, well, no, Pisces. Um, what's after Pisces? They'll say Pisces. Give me a second. They'll say Pisces, then Aries, then Taurus. It's three months. No. If I go say, say this is the 15th of the of the first month of Nisan, then I go to the 15th of Aries, that's only one month. If I go to the 15th of Taurus, that's only two months, okay? So from the beginning of the month, of the third month, from the beginning of the first month, there's only two months in between. So it's only been a difference of two months. And so that's what we're seeing because of the procession of the equinoxes, they're now de declaring this, even though in the beginning, God was declaring this as the Feast of First Fruits, that Taurus, that this was the beginning of the year, which is Taurus. And that the 16th day in Taurus, which is the month of Savan, this was the beginning of creation. The 16th day, which is the Feast of First Fruits, is the 16th day in Taurus. That's what all of them there knew. Because Taurus was the beginning. As he declared to them in Exodus 12, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. So what was he telling? It shall be the first month of the year. So what is he saying? This was Savan 1, what we now call Savan 1, 
but in God back in in Moses day in all their days this was actually called the first day of the first month again we can prove it none of it is made up the Jews even acknowledge it themselves but because we live in a year in in a time thousands of years later where the procession of the equinoxes have caused it to go off by two months you see does it mean God changes does it mean the father changes says oh okay Sorry, I'm, I'm not going to do it there. This procession of the equinoxes, yeah, we've got to move it up a bit. Is it possible? Is it possible that this, that this um, X marks the spot is a declaration that Nissan 1 is now Taurus? Because people are showing the, the Aleph? Maybe. That's what I'm saying. I'm not discounting anything, but that's not the rest. That's not all the evidence. That's not all the evidence. We have to look at what is actually taking place. This is the constellation of Taurus. And if God doesn't change, he's not going to change his law. Then this is the 16th day of Savan in 2024 is the beginning you see why would it have been such a mystery that in verse 18 in the gospel of thomas he's telling them whoever discovers the beginning discovers the end why would it be such a mystery why in isaiah 46 is he saying declaring the end from the beginning from ancient times the things that are not done yet done and it's and it's a mystery. So if he's declaring things from the declaring the end from the beginning, we need to seek out what the beginning is to understand where the end is and what the end is about. That's exactly what he's saying here in the Gospel of Thomas. So we have a confirmation here in Scripture. So everything is still pointing to Taurus. But does it mean that God is saying, well, Forget you guys in saying, well, the sun has gone off course by two months. Well, we can't do anything about the sun. Of course, the sun has gone off by two months. The, the whole world knows it. But the fact that it's gone off and we can't change it, God is in control of these things. Does it mean God is completely disregarding that where Nissan is now? That, that there's no account for it? No, I don't think so. I believe Nissan, in our lifespan, in, in our day and age, Nissan is where it's supposed to be because of the procession of the equinoxes. But what I'm also saying is God isn't going to change his law because the sun has progressed. I believe he's telling us, no, as it was in the beginning, so will it be in the end. And my count will begin from the 16th of Savan, like the Feast of First Fruits was in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 1. So when we look at the at the uh, uh, constellations, we're now in Pisces. Jesus' time was Aries, but in the beginning was Taurus. I don't say we disregard the fact that we're now two more months back from it or gone forward from it because you're going to see things still have to be accounted for what i'm telling you is that things will be accounted for but it doesn't change what god is telling us the end will begin from because it begins from as the end is as it was in the beginning and this is what gives us the understanding of the end and the season and time that we're looking for. So as we've been able to declare and show biblically, scripturally, historically, sun, moon, and stars, that 2024 is by all accounts the year, what about when it will begin? 
And this is why I'm establishing with you that the beginning was Taurus. Because if in the beginning it was Taurus, and it was, and everything that the Jews know about in history tells us it was Taurus, <coughs> and Scripture tells us that whoever finds the beginning will find the end. For in the end, there the beginning is. And the beginning was the 16th day in Taurus. Then that means in 2024, according to the Father, June 22nd, the 16th of Savan, is the beginning count to our beginning of the end of days. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go back now to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 in order. We know the birth of Christ, right? We were showing that the birth of Christ, like others, is connected like Isaac and so forth. Third month, middle of the month. Same with Judah. Same with, as we said, you go to the, the sun, moon, and stars, and you trace everything back as these guys had done. And see, when Jesus was born, he was born on the 15th day of the third month. So if Jesus was born on the 15th day of the third month, and we come to here, and we understand that Luke in order 1, 2, 3, 4 is the pre-trib, Eight days for the seven of the wedding, then the eighth day begins the 40 days, and the 40 days is a picture of his birth. And then from there, then it's the end of seals and the end of trumpets. And we saw that Hebrews 11 gave us the same picture with, with Enoch, and then Noah, and then Abraham, and then the birth of Isaac. We're seeing the same thing of the pre, the 40 days, the mid, and the post. So this is why until last year, we, until about this time, I think last year, February or March, I think it was last year, we had that incredible revelation that I spoke on an, um, many, many times. Because if we understood Luke in order, which we do, and we know that this 40 days of his birth is represented as the 40 days of Noah in Luke chapter 17, not Matthew 24, but in Luke 17, and, and it relates to the 40 days of Noah, in Hebrews 11 as well, because it's when he comes as the white horse rider, when he is the son of man coming, he is going to be here warning as he said he would, as Jonah did in Luke 11. We know that this is a picture. Well, what does it say? It's connected to his birth. And his birth was, wait a second, his birth is the 15th day of the third month. Well, wait a second. In our day and age, I'm going to say this slowly for you guys. In our day and age, Nisan is the first month, which means Savan is in our day and age, the third month, and this is the 15th day. Well, then Jesus was born in our day and age, in our placement of the sun. This year would be June 21st, and it would be the 15th day of the third month. You see? Because I'm talking about in our present day and age. This is the third month. But to the Father, the constellations have never moved. So, to the Father, this is still the beginning. But in our day and age, because we have to live according to the sun's movement, <laughs> you're not going to be planting your, your spring wheat in the middle of summer or at the beginning of summer. And that's because of the sun. So, we have to live according to where the sun is. And when you do that, this is the first month. But the Father hasn't changed. And that's why the 16th day of Savan is the mystery of in the beginning to understand what is the end. So in our day and age, Jesus being born on the 15th day of the third month, Jesus was born right here. So you've got the 15th, 16th right here in Taurus. Pretty wild, right? 
because the 16th you have Ayin. Jesus was born the 15th and it's called what? It's called Taurus, right? It's the head of Taurus. This is the head of Taurus. So what do you get? You got the 16th in Taurus and the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Ayin, which is I. And then you've got Jesus born on the 15th, who is the beginning, who is Taurus. And then you've got the 14th on this side. And it's the 14th in Taurus. And that left eye is the 14th brightest star in the sky that represents 50. <laughs> Come on. It's pretty wild stuff, right? So what, what does this mean? That Jesus is born on the third month, but yet to the Father, this is the beginning. Well, the difference is what? Two months. The difference is two months. <clears throat> See? The world tells us that's where it is now. But we know Jesus was born on the third month, and this was in the beginning. And the constellations have never changed. They've never shifted places. It's been the sun that sped up. So this is where it is now. And we have to what? There's, an, there's been an adjustment of two months. Let that sink in. It is off by two months. So what do you think <coughs> the chances are that the father, knowing it's off by two months, will make the appropriate adjustment that when it all shakes out, it still lands according to the calendars that the world is living on because that is where the sun is. Well, that means there has to be an adjustment made of two months. How can we get that if we know this is when Jesus was born? Jesus was born on the 15th day of the third month. Period. So if he's born on the 15th day of the third month, and we go to Luke chapter 2 because we're following these things in order and know that Luke in order and the birth of Christ is a prophetic picture of the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man, then shouldn't it be connected to his birth? And this is something until last year, I thought this is what it was. I thought this was going to be the Feast of Weeks. There's your seven-day wedding, and then the Lord returning right here. But even though this is, this is the beginning where the Lord is, where the Father is, as I just said, and this is where Jesus was born on the 15th day of the third month, how can these be reconciled? To the Father, this is the beginning. But in our life, and Jesus was here in the flesh, he was born on the 15th day of the third month. There, there's there's a, a gap. There's something that has to be reconciled, connected to Jesus' birthday to account for two months. And you guessed it. If you're new, this will blow you away. If you've been here for a while, you're like, I knew it was coming, Alan. I get it. Well, just hold on, guys. It has to all be in one video. Let everybody track this. We've been in Genesis. We've been in the Gospels. We've been in, in talking about Revelation. We've been connecting it all over the place. It's everywhere. We've used the scriptures from parts of the beginning through it to the end. We've used the sun, the moon, the stars. We're talking uh, um, historical evidences, documents, coins. All of it laying out the story. And it comes to us from Isaiah 9.1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it was in her vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And afterward more grievously afflicted her, okay? So there was a light affliction that came to two northern cities in Israel. We've spoken on this many times. And then it says, and we know that this is the beginning of the 50 days. The pre-trib happens, and two northern cities represented as ancient Zebulun and Naphtali will be attacked and destroyed, which is Haifa and Tel Aviv. We've understood this for a long time. 
when this scripture came to us and it popped out last year, about a year ago, mind blowing. My the circuits in my brain were frying. I was so excited. In Isaiah 9 2. And then it says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them had the light shined. Of course, this is Jesus. Jesus shows up after Zebulun and Naphtali, Naphtali have been attacked. And it's a picture of Jesus showing up in the prophetic as well as what took place in the is. But in the prophetic, it's a picture of him showing up at the beginning of his 40 days. And guess what? Look at what it said. Verse 6, for unto us a child is born. Well, if for unto us a child is born, and Luke 2 is for unto us a child is born, and there he is, it would certainly seem <clears throat> like the 40 days of the Son of Man that we know happens after the pre-trib would be connected to his birth. Wouldn't the 40 days then begin here? <clears throat> Seems natural. Seems like there it is, right, right in this place right here. But that doesn't account yet for being two months off. Because this is the third month as Jesus came in the flesh at his birth. Yet to the Father, this is the beginning. So there's still something, something a little skewed there, right? But yet we've got two things, two places that told us it's connected to his 40 days as his birth. And we know that the first affliction comes in northern Israel on Haifa and Tel Aviv right after the pre-trib escape. And this Middle Eastern war that will break out in that attack will be a short-lived war that will last one week. And the Lord returns on the eighth day, like the end of Luke chapter 1, pre-trib, eight days. The Lord returns on the eighth day and begins his 40 days. In Luke chapter 2, it's his birth. Isaiah 9, 6, it's telling us, connected to unto us, a child is born. But guess what? This was where it got spectacular. Because then I was shared that Luke, or I found it in a study, I was studying that Jesus also fulfilled this from Isaiah 9 in Matthew chapter 4. You guys all know it if you've been around for a bit. Starting in verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast, in the border of Zebulun and Naphtali that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet in the land of Zebulun and in the town and in the land of Naphtali by way of the sea beyond the Galilee the people which sat in darkness saw great light and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death the light sprung up Jesus fulfilled it in the is it was prophesied in the was in an event that took place and bam he fulfilled it in the is and what do we know about fulfilling the was and the is in the is to come ecclesiastes 1 9 one of our favorites the thing that has been okay the was from creation to christ has been is that which shall be, which means the is to come. And that which is done, which is from Christ until the beginning of the end of days at the pre-trib, is that which shall be done. Was to Christ, is from Christ to the beginning at the pre-trib, both of them shall be done as I was talking about earlier. What was and what is, both shall be replayed in a condensed period of above and 14 years. So we're seeing this from Isaiah into Matthew, where Jesus fulfilled it. Now, you have to ask yourself, hold on a second. 
it said for unto us a child is born did jesus fulfill this at his birth no it says he came walking through so he didn't fulfill it like he did at like like at 40 days of his birth like luke chapter 2 he didn't fulfill it in Isaiah 9 as it said for unto us a child is born that looks like it's connected to his birth. Clearly, he came strolling through when he was about 30 years old or so. You see? But was it probably around the time of his birth? <clears throat> well, how about we find out what it said? I remember when I first read this and I was blown away, but then there was something missing soon as that date had passed last year the following day within hours i received it and it was when i came back and read right here you guys all know it matthew 4 12. now when jesus had heard that john was cast into prison well guess what when jesus when john was cast into prison it wasn't the time of jesus's birthday anymore we all know it, right? We've taught on it many times. John was in prison for about 10 months. About 10 months. Okay? But if you go to Luke chapter 3, in Luke chapter 3, <coughs> check it out. Jesus was baptized, right? Jesus is baptized. The Holy Ghost descends like a dove. And what? Jesus himself began to be about 30. John is baptizing, and it's the time of Jesus' birthday. Okay? So just like we showed here, John is baptizing. It's the time of Jesus' birthday. We know it's the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Jesus begins to be 30. But guess what? If you go to John chapter 3, check this out. Let's go to John chapter 3 in our e sword and listen to what it says. Remember, this is in relation to John being cast into prison. Check this out. Okay. Uh, starting in verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So now Jesus is with a group of his disciples and he's come to the land of Judea and he's baptizing. And now listen to this. Clearly, he had already gone through his 40 days in the wilderness. So you've already got a month and 10 days. And then you had this period of time to hear. And John's still not in prison. Remember in Luke, in, uh, in Matthew 4, John was now in prison, it said. And we know Jesus' birthday, if it was connected to his birth as it appeared in Luke 4, uh, in Luke 2, and in Isaiah chapter 9, we needed to know, is it really connected to his birthday? Because then it must have a count that begins in June of 2024. But we know there's this, this account of two months that has to be accounted for. And does the Father do it for us? That's what we're looking at here to find out when this year will be. And if we know he was in the wilderness tempted by Satan for 40 days, and then he's still roaming around, he has some of his disciples, he's now in Judea and he's baptizing people, and John wasn't yet cast in prison. How long do you think that was? About two months. Listen to what it says. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to, uh, near to Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. And they go on to say, oh, 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 why is Jesus over there? Why is the one you bore as witness, he's over there baptizing people? And John says, look, you yourselves bear me witness that I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that has, listen to this. Do you think this is prophetic? John 3, 29. He that has the bride 
is the bridegroom. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. That means in his in this picture of timing, which is going to be just before, you know what this is a picture of, right? If John isn't yet in prison, as it says, then this isn't yet, quite yet, the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Which means it's the period of the wedding, that one week that comes first. And look at what it says. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. John is saying the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. He's saying Jesus has the bride. And John wasn't yet in prison. Which means it, it, it was maybe like a week before John was cast into prison at this point. How do we know? Because in Matthew chapter 4, it then says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison. How do we know? Because John was about 10 months in prison. And Jesus was still around doing things after his baptism by John. He was then 40 days in the wilderness. He had his disciples. He was roaming around. He was baptizing people. And John was still there baptizing people in another place. Which means it was about two months. What are we looking for? We're looking for two months. How do we account for a two months difference of Nisan to Savan that can bring us this count into the rest of 2024. Because if we're looking for the count to begin at Jesus' birthday, as Luke would assume to be telling us, as Isaiah 9 would assume to be telling us, well, we just got the answer in Isaiah chapter 9 and in especially in 4 because we find out in Matthew chapter 4 that when Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 9, it actually wasn't at his birthday. It was about two months later. And we could prove it because of the 40 days and a short period of time after that, maybe a couple few weeks, about two months. Then John was cast into prison. Well, guess what? That means... If this is Jesus' birthday, the third month, 15th day, if we go two months later, it would be the 15th, right? It would be August 19th, which would be the 15th of Av. So here's your 15th to the 16th of Av. That is our connection from the 15th to the 16th of Savan from June. He didn't fulfill it on his birthday he actually fulfilled it two months later and what are we trying to understand in account a difference of two months a difference of two months that accounts for this this bizarre uh, uh, procession of equinoxes that that has thrown off our calendars yet lands where everything will start according to where the beginning was to the father yet has to be connected to the birth of christ but two months later from it that's what we've revealed all of it with scripture so now listen to what happens <clears throat> listen to what happens Okay, here we are, Jesus' birthday, but when that scripture is fulfilled, it said that, what do we know? Haifa and Tel Aviv will be attacked and destroyed, <clears throat> the two northern cities, <clears throat> and after they've had that light affliction of the first attack, Jesus shows up about two months after his birthday 
It wasn't actually at his birthday, but about two months later. And what is it? That would mean the week before, which starts the 50 days, is the 9th of Av, which is a historical attack throughout history on Israel. And what are we pointing to? A biblical account throughout the entirety of this with all the things of history and the sun, moon, and stars saying that the pre-trib goes and the 50 days begin <clears throat> with a light affliction in two northern cities. Not back here <clears throat> at Jesus' birthday, but from a count that begins in the beginning and is counted out as <clears throat> seven Sabbaths. So from the sheaf of the wave offering, from the Sabbath after shall you number seven Sabbaths, right? Seven weeks. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Look what happened. We got to count by counting from where God the Father said it was in the beginning, where Jesus told us in the Gospel of Thomas, where Isaiah 6, 46 told us, in the beginning is the end from the beginning, the end, the end from the beginning. This was the beginning. And though this represents now the third month and the place where Jesus' birth was, we find out that the story of the first attack didn't actually happen in the seven days before his actual birth, but that it was related to about two months later and the attack that was seven days before called the light affliction that he then came to shine his light on. All there in Scripture. I hope you're tracking. I didn't make any of this up. Not one iota. Every single dot and tittle and part and piece is from Scripture. Every account is from Scripture. So what happens when we do this count? We know that it was two months, <clears throat> about two months from his birthday. We know that you have to count as it was in the beginning. And whoever finds the beginning will find the end. And we found the beginning. And the books of the end have opened to us. And when we've done this, we count the seven Sabbaths or the seven weeks. And we get to the eighth of Av, which will be the pre-trib of the Luke White Bride of Christ. And then it will begin the 50 days. And that 50 days will begin with the Isaiah 9 light affliction on Haifa and Tel Aviv. We have taught how it's the seven-day war that that will last. And the Lord returns on the eighth day about two months from his birthday. Exactly as Scripture said. Remember Isaiah 9? What comes next? Then the big affliction? Syria. Who did we show Syria was? And the Philistines behind them? Who did Syria represent? Uh, Assad. The one who brings the attack like Ishmael on the day and hour no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets. All of it is in order. Everything. <clears throat> so, now watch this. Let's, let's finish it up. Let's bring this to an end. We now know that if we count as it was in the beginning so that we can find the end, we know we're counting from right here. 16th of Sivan, June 22nd, which represents... The Feast of First Fruits as it was in the beginning. Is that where First Fruits is now? Well, no, it, it's it's over here. It's Resurrection Day, right? Because it's the accounting. I mean, in our physical, because of the sun's movement, this is where it is. But the Father, just because the sun has moved, 
The constellations have never moved, and the Father hasn't changed. This is still where it is to the Father. So when we found the beginning and we account for this and we can show it in Scripture and we know it's two months difference, what does it tell us to do? Well, watch what happens. We go to Deuteronomy 16 and we see in verse 9, seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn what do we know about this word for corn this word for corn can mean grain so maybe it's barley maybe it's wheat maybe it's rye maybe it's this maybe it's that well guess what scripturally it's only barley or it's wheat but guess what we know we've proven that this isn't wheat uh, uh, that this isn't barley we've proven that this corn is actually wheat all you have to do is read the next verse and thou shall keep the feast of weeks unto the lord thy god with a tribute of a free will offering what did it say seven weeks shall you number from when you begin to put the sickle to the corn and you'll keep the feast of weeks of course because it's the feast of weeks well if you recall we just recently went to numbers 28 and in numbers 28 verse 6 26 it says also in the day of the first fruits okay what first fruits well just so you're clear let's go to it um numbers 28 verse 26 listen to what it says also in the day of look at this first fruits in the day of first fruits this isn't the feast of first fruits jesus this is the feast uh, uh, this is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. When you bring a new meat offering unto the Lord, listen to this, this is key, after your weeks be out. After your weeks are finished. Then you bring to me the first fruits of the wheat harvest, a new meat offering. Okay, so when is this feast of weeks? When is the feast of, uh, uh, sorry, when is the first fruits of the feast of weeks brought in? At the end of those seven weeks. And it was called a new, where is it? Oh, uh, new weeks be out. A new meat offering is brought to him. Okay, look what happens when you go to Leviticus 23. When Moses got the law, Taurus was the beginning. Okay? Taurus was the beginning. So watch and see how the Lord, having given us this account of the difference of two months going forward, lands it smack dab. There's your Feast of Weeks, right? The uh, uh, Leviticus uh, 23 Verse 15, you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seven Sabbaths shall you number 50 days, which means after the seven Sabbath, then there's going to be a count of 50 days, okay? And so you're going to count 50 days, but when those seven Sabbaths are over, what are you going to do? You're going to offer a new meat offering. Huh. What is it? It's the wheat baked with leaven, the two loaves of wheat with leaven, and they are what? The first fruits, which is the same one, 1061 in the Hebrew, as this one here for Feast of Weeks. And what are they doing? A new meat offering. When did it say? When your weeks be out. When the seven Sabbaths are over. And so we count from here, and the main reason to understand counting from there, well, we had the revelation of whoever finds the end finds the beginning. So we're counting from there because we have found the beginning to find the end. But guess what else it is? It's when you put the sickle to the wheat. How do we know it's wheat? Because it's the count of the feast of weeks. 
And what is the count of the Feast of Weeks, guys? The Feast of Weeks is, and thou shalt observe the Feast of Weeks, listen to this, of the first fruits of wheat harvest. I don't even need to say anymore. The Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. We just saw where the first fruits are. We know it's at the end of the seven Sabbaths of the Feast of Weeks, and it's wheat. Which means in Deuteronomy 16, when it says when you put the sickle to the corn, it's unequivocally talking about to the wheat. And the reason the Jews have screwed it up, as we've explained in the previous video, is because they're using spring wheat instead of winter wheat. And you guys all know that story like the back of your hands now. Because there are two wheat harvests. There is spring wheat, which is sown in the spring, harvested in the fall at the same time frame as grapes. There's winter wheat, which is sown in the fall, lives through winter, and is harvested in summer. What? When does the harvest begin? Oh, look at that. First day of summer. You count seven Sabbaths. <clears throat> you get to the eighth of Av. And you get to the historical first, uh, you get to the attacks on Israel throughout Israel's history. You have the two months difference from, from Isaiah when it said from his birth to when John was in prison and he shows up after the two northern cities were attacked. And guess what? There's your after two months. And then what did it say? When your seventh Sabbath, that's when you bring in your feast of first fruits, right? Your two wave loaves with leaven. At the end of what? Winter wheat. It cannot be spring wheat. And as you guys all know, as we wind this all down, it's the difference between Leah and Rachel. And it is absolutely why we read in Genesis 29 that Laban tells him afterwards in verse 26, and Laban said, it must not so be done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Who's the firstborn? Older. What is winter wheat called? Older wheat, old wheat. Not because it's old, but because it was planted first. And who's the younger? The spring wheat. Like people say, a spring chicken, right? The younger. The younger. You have to have the firstborn before you can have the younger one. And what happened at those seven years? Then he said, fulfill her week. And this was related to her wedding. And what does that word week represent? You got it. The Feast of Weeks. Every one of these. There's her Feast of Weeks for the Feast of Weeks and the seven-day wedding. There's the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, which is the Leah. They're the first fruits. Then you've got Numbers 28 that tells you the Feast of First Fruits is the, is the new meat offering when your weeks be out, which means at the end of the seven Sabbaths. And you've got Deuteronomy 16 telling you when you count them, it's from when you begin to do it, when you put the sickle to the corn, which is absolutely wheat. So when does the sickle get put to the wheat in the beginning as it was in the beginning so shall it be in the end whoever finds the beginning finds the end what is this the beginning what is this the beginning of the count of the end of days of the seven sabbaths to the end of the wheat harvest at the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the pre-trib observe her week from the feast of weeks for her one week wedding to which the Lord returns after the first northern attack in two cities when he shows up about two months after his birthday in the equivalent of when John was cast into prison and then he fulfills his 40 days as the son of man. And when his 40 days are over, around September 29th, there's three days of the raven. Of the ravenous raven Ishmael, 
Syria, who Jesus was warning, will compass them about. And before the attack, the anointing of the Holy Ghost will take place on the 50th day, which would be October 2nd. Remember, then shall you number 50 days. This is the 50-day count from in the beginning after the seven Sabbaths. Then from that anointing that the workers will get, they go out from Jerusalem and Syria and those with them that have compassed them about on the day and hour no one knows, just like history in Jeremiah chapter 40 and 41 at the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, Syria, Ishmael, will attack and destroy Jerusalem and it will be the time of the red horse rider beginning and it starts with the attack and the destruction of Jerusalem at the Feast of Trumpets. And we've explained, and I'm not going to do it now, we've done it already, to show why Mark has a day and hour no one knows at the end of it and why Matthew has a day and hour no one knows and then Noah, which equals one more year. Because at the end of six years, it will be the day and hour no one knows. At the end of six years of trumpets or 13 years of tribulation, it will be the day and hour no one knows and the final year as Noah, which is the destruction of all the enemies with the Lord as Zechariah 14. It's awesome. It's so incredible. So now I'll leave you again with John or almost done, but John chapter four, which we've recently broken down to tie in to all of it, which is telling us the exact same picture. And our brother Ivan that I was talking about that I've shared a couple times, he did a video about it and he's got it all charted all the way back through all the kings and their times and the periods and all of this. And he contacted me to say, look, when you were showing that John chapter four is actually Jesus when he says, hey, say not you, there are yet four months and then comes harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white, which means Luke, by the way, already to harvest. I had claimed to you guys and proclaimed the truth of this, which was the revelation that was dropped into my spirit the other day that revealed that Jesus is saying, hey, you Jews are looking for a harvest that comes in the fall, which is the spring wheat ready to be harvested. I'm telling you, look up because the one that starts to be harvested four months early is the one for Luke. It's the Leah that comes before the Rachel. And Ivan, through his study, went through and tracked it all and saw that in this, in following the Gospel of John through, that when Jesus made this declaration, it was indeed, as we revealed, four months. Four months before, right in this range here, it was four months before, right when the wheat harvest of winter wheat starts to get harvested. Remember, it's not harvested yet. Jesus says, look, this one is now ready to harvest. So the harvest starts, it takes seven weeks, and when it's done, this is when the first fruits of the wheat harvest of the two loaves with leaven are brought in. They are looking for the, uh, um, for the spring wheat, which is what? Four months later. It is absolutely revealed. We know what Jesus was proclaiming. This is the beginning of the sickle to the winter wheat harvest and begins the seven week, seven Sabbath count to the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest brought in baked with bread, baked with leaven. It is the season and time of the end so when we say and when we're showing the the incredible evidence 
all-encompassing evidence that I have shown you tonight for 2024, I cannot find anything that comes against or contradicts 2024. But I do not have a thus saith the Lord. But I have the revelation. I have the revelation of the open books that we've all been sharing in. And the revelation is showing in every part and piece and parcel and everything is showing that indeed the entirety of it is in order. In 2024, from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, we are in the seventh year. And when their 50 days remain, after the seven Sabbaths, at the start, the pre-trib Gentile Luke White Wheat Bride of Christ first fruits, like Leah, is gone. And the 50 days will begin with the attack in northern Israel. Then the 40 days of the Son of Man starting on the eighth day, warning about Ishmael, Syria, and those with them coming to surround and attack. They're to know to flee. Then it'll be three more days, the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the 50th day <clears throat> by those who follow Jesus as his remnant workers, his remnant bride workers for 40 days, will then receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost and will go out from Jerusalem preaching to all sections of the earth, probably transformation translations all over the earth will be happening to this group on a normal basis we're talking about the beginning of the end of days not mythical not 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 um you know typology we're talking about the physical literal actual beginning of the end of days and it will start with tens of millions of people vanishing from the earth try to have your unbelieving family accept that one well guess what all we have to do is share with them and pray that the Lord will open their eyes ears and will circumcise their hearts to receive because when it happens there will be no way on earth that they can deny that they were not told in advance. And so why do we do it even if they won't believe us now? We don't harp on them. But why do we, can, why do we tell them? Because when it comes to pass, they would believe. Brothers and sisters, it's all there. It's all there. The whole story is there for us. And look what happens. Do you remember Zechariah? We shared on this so much back in the day. Because Zechariah chapter 7 is like the end. It's, the, it's like the end of the seals, right? The seventh year of seals time frame. And I've spoke on this so much in the beginning, years ago. But we didn't have the rest of the picture. And so we spoke on it. I spoke on it for a couple of years. And then it kind of went away for two or three years. And then in the last year, year and a half, it started to come back on our radar. Why? Because remember what I was saying? The Lord understands that in our day and age, this is the third month. But it doesn't change the fact to him that this is the beginning. It doesn't change it. But in our day and age, it's the third month. So with this count, we know that prophetically in the revelation of the scriptures and doing this count when we got here and we end up at a historicals, historical attacks in Israel on the day that the attack would happen. And we get to the two months later from Christ in the place where it talked about the first attack before the second attack that comes after the 50 days 
at the Feast of Trumpets, the day and now where no one knows, which is a historical attack by Ishmael? How did it still end up landing? On the 9th of Av to begin the 50, and at the end of 50 to be the Feast of Trumpets of the day and hour no one knows to be one attack and two attack. It still landed on the 5th month, fasting and mourning, and on the ninth month, fasting and mourning. Do you know why it had to? <clears throat> because it was prophesied. We've been talking about this for five and a half years in this ministry. In Zechariah chapter 7, verse 5, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years, did you at all ever do it unto me? Look at what it says. Verse 7. Should you not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity? All past tense. Right now it's inhabited. Right now it's in prosperity. And the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south and the plain. They inhabit the south and the plain now. It is inhabited. It is in prosperity. This is saying when it was. And what does it say about it? The fifth and seventh month is the connection to it when they fasted and mourned for all that time. And we knew in this ministry for over five and a half years that the fasting and mourning in the fifth month is the ninth of Av. And the fasting of the morning in the seventh month is Feast of Trumpets. They observe it on the third of Tishri, but it's from the attack that happened at the Feast of Trumpets. Go figure. We've known that for over five and a half years and then set it aside because the counts just weren't making sense and lining up. I haven't been able to piece it together as we have tonight, but over the past year in particular. But especially tonight, all of this together in one place. Never, ever have I been able to do this so clearly before. We can now literally understand how it gets to the ninth and seventh month and the fasting and mourning based on two attacks. Something that we have known about for five and a half years. Now revealed by understanding what the Lord said. In the beginning is the end, and whoever finds it will not taste of death, but will take their place in the beginning. Doesn't mean we're taking our place in the beginning right here. But in the beginning, which means what? Well, let me close it off with this. Our famous revelation of the 14 years and 50 days. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 2. This is, people always look at this with eyes of what is. How it was when Christ was here and when Paul was talking about this. This is a prophetic prophecy intertwined within it everybody says well this was paul explaining his experiences yeah and one time he says he was in christ and then he says well he's kind of like a man in christ it's prophecy clues twisted into it weaved in through it verse 2 i knew a man in christ above 14 years those who are in christ spirit filled are the ones who go first above 14 years and that's the 50 days, right before the 50 days starts, bang, the pre-trib is gone. Where do they go? They're like a rapture, and they're going to the third heaven. This is that timing right in here. According to the Hebrew calendar count, from a count with Taurus from the beginning, revealing the count of the end, it's not that we go here it's that this is the beginning of the end 
revealed from the beginning, revealing the end. And the corn, the wheat, sickle is put to the wheat. And when the seven Sabbaths are done, the loaves with leaven, first fruits unto Christ and to the Father, are gone. And then shall you number 50 days. That's the 50 days in the above 14 years. That's the pre-trib bride of Christ right there, brothers and sisters. And the eye knew such a man, verse 4, how that he was caught up to paradise. This is the great mid-trib, the, the great multitude mid-trib rapture in the seventh year of seals. And then listen to what he says here. Verse 14, behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. So even though it's Paul, it's a prophetic picture of Christ in pre, mid, and post. A taking to the third heaven, a taking to paradise mid-trib, and his return when he's coming to them the third time. And now he's not bringing any burden to the Jews or anything, but they being the parents having understood these things throughout all of their generations and thousands of years, they were the parents over the rest of us. And this burden, because they were his chosen people, they bore that burden and they were blinded and they became enemies for our sakes so that his focus could be turned to us. But when that time is over, it will be turned back to them. And it'll be their glory with Christ in their promised millennial reign when he comes feet down and then ends that 14th year. And when that 14th year is over, do you know what he does? When the 14th year is over and the Jubilee is proclaimed, all those that flew away in protection of the wilderness will be brought back into the land and each will be given their portions in their lands as they had been promised. And the millennial reign will begin. All debts, everything forgiven, and liberty is proclaimed. And the millennial reign begins. All here in its order and in its place. Man, brothers and sisters, I hope this blesses you. I hope you have, you're grasping it. I hope you take the time to follow it and to track it because it's all in order. There was no hiccup. There was no glitch. There, I wasn't uncertain. Mm, maybe this, no. It's laid out right there in all incredible details. As I've repeatedly said from Scripture, the sun, moon, and stars, historical documents, evidence, shroud, coins, history, and all throughout the Word. The books are opened. And there just so happened to be somebody, as I open this, who knew about the time of the end, a body of men that would be raised up, who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst of much clamor and opposition. Exactly what we deal with every day. But hallelujah, I wouldn't change it for all anything of anything ever. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ and we have been raised up. Brothers and sisters, I love you. I appreciate you. I thank you for your prayers and your support for the ministry here and abroad in Uganda. We're always so grateful. I love you. God bless you all. God bless your families. And we'll talk to you soon. Don't forget, watch it again if you need to bite it off in pieces and understand 2024 is going to be glorious i love you guys bye again talk to you soon